Reactive Training Systems. Welcome back to the RTS podcast. I'm Mike Tushier, and today I'm talking to Jason Trimble, the owner and head coach of the Strength Guys. Let's see, some. I think you're well known among my audience, but in case anybody you know doesn't know you already, I think some of your claims to fame from a coaching standpoint, you've been a longtime coach for Taylor Atwood, coach for Lee Bavois. And, you know, to be fair, after having known you for a long time, I think those two athletes in particular, and kind of like the big shining star athletes, do kind of take up the majority of the spotlight, but you've coached quite a few people who are high performers, you know, perennially competing at the world championship and so on. So, uh, you've got quite the coaching resume. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mike. Uh, one thing that you missed is I'm also the guy who recklessly prescribes volume to everyone as well. So it's part of my reputation in the community. Well, where would you be if you didn't recklessly do something? Right? Yeah. Where would I be without that? That's right. Yeah. I think that would be interesting thing to touch on. I think we'll get there, but you know, another person that you coach, somebody, a, a friend of mine, actually, uh, Sammy DePoss, I just ran into her at the NAPF, or I guess Arian also coached for the strength guys, coaches her, uh, ran into her in the Kings, uh, where she did phenomenal, set a bunch of personal bests and is becoming more and more competitive in the 76 category. You know, she brings up a good point though. Like why not the strength people? I started TSG when I was 19 and it was me and the, the co-owner at the time. Uh, we were going to get our degrees in kinesiology and we wanted a way to network with the strength and conditioning community uh, for the four years that we were in the university so that when we finish, we would have a network to call upon and hopefully get internships or a job or something like that. And so we uh, started the account under the name, the strength guys and never intended for it to be a company, a business, anything like that. But I think it's a good business practice that when people want to pay you for something, you should say yes and, and give them the thing that they want to pay you for. So generally, um, yeah, yeah. So. It, you want to provide a product that the market is interested in and people kept requesting programming. So, uh, this one, we opened our doors and started training, uh, people back then it was for natural bodybuilding and we experimented with some crappy names. I think at one point in time, we thought the mitochondria is powerhouse of the cell, but we're max. Like we're going to do this to the max. So we're going to be powerhouse max performance. I thought that was a cool name at the time. And then a few hours later, I was like, no, that's not good. <laughs> so we just, we decided to keep going with TSG. And I'd say like three years later, I saw the strength athlete come up and I was like, damn it, that's a better name than us, but we're already locked in. So that Sammy can refer to us as TSG instead of uh, the strength guys, if we want to be more inclusive. I think, I think it's just kind of where her mind goes. Good luck changing it from the strength people for Sammy. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't sound very, you know? <laughs> yeah. So. Well, it's maybe it's, it's one of those things that people who know you best can, you know, one of the, one of those nicknames that your friends can use, but maybe nobody else. Right. Yeah. There yeah. You go. That's fine. Yeah. So. But, I guess kind of getting more into the core of our conversation today. One of the things I've always appreciated about you and conversations with you, Jason, is that you're always updating and refining your systems. You're always making more and more effort to understand what it is that's causing the effects that you want to see in your athletes and that you're addressing problems that you notice, you know, um, and I know that we've talked about different problems that each of us have noticed over the years and ways that we're trying to address that. And, uh, that's something that I've always appreciated about your program. And I think that's a very admirable 
way to be. That's one of my values as well. Yeah, I think. Sound funny, but I think people probably think that you and I have it a lot more figured out than we think, yeah. right? We have a lot of experience in different scenarios with different people, but there's always the possibility that the next scenario is one that we haven't encountered. And when you do that, you need to surround yourself with a network of people who may have encountered that scenario so that they can update your knowledge with their knowledge and you can learn something new from everyone else. So yeah, I always trying to make things better, uh, whether that's programming, be coaching, athlete monitoring, communication system, business, you know, I just like kind of that obsessive personality type that likes to tinker and try to make something into a cohesive system with rules. If this happens, this, this happens, this, this happens, you do this, and then continue to iterate on that until I feel like it's, that's the way it should be. And it is. I'd say in most of the areas that I work, it's never final, but in some areas I, I've gotten it to a point where it's like, yeah, that's, that's the way it is. And like, you kind of check that off the list and you move on to the next one. So it's one of the things I appreciate about you as well, Mike, is I, you know, we're both this way. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I enjoy the problem solving aspect of it, you know, and you know, in some scenarios it's solving the problem of how to get an athlete stronger, but sometimes reducing instances of injury and things like that, which I think is part of what I wanted to uh, touch on uh, today. Yeah. I think that's kind of been something that's been on both of our radars. I mean, it's on any good coach's radar, right? Uh, but it varies in its priority, I guess. You do have to get an athlete stronger and injury is People get really funny when you want to start talking about injury and, you know, what does or doesn't work and prevention, like injury prevention. Well, prevention is not a thing and it's all about risk management and that's, that can all be fine. But from a coaching standpoint, you do things that are either presenting a risk or not, and you've got to manage that, you know, and you can have athletes that perform a certain thing and get by uh, and by get by i mean they're able to do it and not get injured and probably during that you know if your main focus is on developing strength they're probably getting stronger and that's looking very successful uh, but you may not be aware of the risk that you're assuming by doing that unless you're really paying attention you know and yeah by really paying attention like something that you did that that i think was really cool uh, we talked about like just collecting injury stats, you know, being mindful of it, you know, if you coach people for long enough, you coach enough people for long enough, people do get hurt, they get dinged up. Uh, and it's usually not major things, life altering things, but they're, you know, painful things and they happen. And so if you are careful in your observations about that, you may be able to start making some, uh, some judgments on what things are tend to correlate with uh, those risk exposures, you know, and yeah. different ways that you might want to manage that. So do you want to speak to that? Like, what did you do? And like, what are some of the things that you notice? Yeah. So I think the start point for that is that I think this is not an I thing. This is a we thing. We at she believe that if wellness and readiness are sufficient, there's a specific dose of training that's required to increase strength. And that dose has to be overloaded over time to continue to stimulate the body to forge new adaptation and ultimately improve your performance. And then I think the next layer of that, as we've been working with this, this amazing uh, sports scientist from Italy, his name is Enrico Roma, and he is currently doing his PhD on statistics, but he also has a background in exercise science and he's passionate about powerlifting. And he 
created a formula for training dose, which you know, we spent hours talking about this on call. What is training dose? And I think that's something that I'm still trying to fully unpack, but our first iteration of training dose, but not our first, because we used to treat this only as volume, right? As tonnage, uh, but now we're looking at volume intensity and the length of time between assessments is also the dose, right? And I remember uh, looking at, Can you elaborate on yeah, that? so for us to gauge the response for a surprisingly little amount of time, we've had training journals now for just over a year. Uh, we finally switched our systems over to Google Sheets and started looking at athletes training journal data and it's been a wealth of information and very helpful in getting some cases right that I think I would have gotten wrong uh, without that tool. And yeah, one of the, one of the things that we're looking at with that is the estimated 1RM trend because we finally have that. But for us, like when you add weight, if RPE is not increasing at a proportionate rate to adding weight, then from week to week, then is the estimated water end growing because the training was too easy. And now, you know, you're adding weight, but it's still pretty easy. So that formula is inflated or, you know, what's going on there. And it's probably a lot more difficult for us to, unless we're doing a flat loaded training protocol, which we often do, you know, like in a preparatory phase, we'll ease someone into an increase in volume and then we'll ease them into an increase in intensity. But once you get to that point where you're training hard and heavy and like 80 to 95% weights, the answer isn't always to continue increasing. Sometimes you just need to give it more time and see what's going to happen. Right. So yeah, I, for us, we have estimated water end trends. We're looking at measures of fatigue in the training journal and Basically, that's just a decrease in performance, whether it's RPE going up, speed going down, estimated 1RM going down throughout the workout. And we still, it's kind of like a carryover for our old training approach. We still do assessments and uh, we'll do either AMRAP assessment, VPT assessments, where we're taking a single as fast as the lifter can do at 70, 75, 80, 85, and 90%. And then running the linear regression on that, the apps do it now and give you an estimated one. And we have ways of updating that profile into our system so that we have those speeds and we can compare them historically across time, uh, an RPE test. So lifters will train with RPE all the time, but, uh, if we actually wanted to do a dedicated assessment of your performance level with RPE. Uh, it's likely that this is going to be a heavier set than what you've been doing in training, or it's a set where we're not giving you a suggested load range or anything. We're just saying, here's a triple at RP eight and figure out what that is. Let us know, <laughs> you know, and seeing what they do. And then you also have one rep max testing, which I'd say is pretty uncommon because we don't train that maximally that often. And then finally, I think the ultimate assess of what you're doing and whether it's working is meet day, you know, but did you improve your performance relative to your last meet? And so we do these assessments normally at the end of a deload, at the end of a block and block length is generally three to eight weeks. So at that length of time between assessments is what we're quantifying is like the duration of training. So, okay. Okay. And so I got on a tangent so just to there. Let me summarize for you real quick. So the assessment piece is like some sort of performance testing and there's various yep. ways that you can do that from AMRAPs to velocity to true maxing and others as well. And then that is that performance testing is getting combined with other metrics from the training uh, volume and intensity to try to come up with a quantification of the training dose. Yeah. So 
that combination is the training one rep max. So you could have an estimated one rep max, which is what the formula tells you you do, or, you know, your velocity estimated one rm. but the training one rep maximum is what the coach thinks you could do. So, uh, we try to factor in that objective performance test, our analysis of your training on a weekly basis. And also factor in the eye test, like looking at you with what I know about you, what do I think you can do? Cause I, I think experienced powerlifting coaches are very good at that. Like look at Matt Gary, you know, he's coached you numerous times. And if he has to ride you to the limit, he, you feel very confident with letting him select that number. And then the final thing is uh, making sure that the technique is the standard because if it's a sloppy lift, but it's stronger than you've done, then that also has to be factored in. Like if pauses are not motionless and you know, did they really get stronger or are they showing some signs of improving, but like technique is actually regressing. And that's a huge problem because if you're not good at that on meet day, like you're going to go two for three or one for three, right. And leave a lot out there. So. It's a multifactorial evaluation, and that's what the training 1RM is. We update the training 1RM after that objective assessment that concludes the end of a block, whether it's any of the six tests that I mentioned, and then we carry on from there. Cool. And then, I mean, I guess taking us back to injury, what have you noticed? in terms of things that might spike your risk? Yeah, so we got off on that tangent of dose and response to establish that first our hypothesis is that if wellness and readiness is sufficient, there's a specific dose required to get stronger. The dose is volume, intensity, and the duration of training between your last assessment and this assessment. Or for you, the dose would be the amount of total training that you've done in a block, something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we're saying that those are the three most deterministic factors of the response that you get from strength training. People are a lot less likely to get injured when they're training further away from the 1RM than closer to the 1RM. Uh, this is just an anecdote. Um, People, I would say this is tricky because if you always train with low volumes, but then you have to start pushing and you're unconditioned for it, then you are, I would say, significantly more likely to get injured, right? So, uh, you can't just say that same with intensity, like if you always train with low intensity, but now you have to go heavy. I mean, you're not even familiar with this, let alone adapted to it. So. That spike in volume or intensity has to present an injury risk. And there's some sports science research on that from uh, Tim Gabbett, probably a lot of other people that I haven't read their papers on as well, but. Well, so this is interesting and you and I have had some conversations about this and then I have had some separate conversations with the other coaches on our team about it. And we batted this idea around a little bit. And I think you're familiar with our concept of stress index, that there's yep. a, it's very similar to, to what you're trying to do in terms of the quantification, the training load, but try to do it better than just a straight tonnage calculation, try to factor in intensity and things like that. And where we're at currently is we'll have the, the total stress, but we'll break that down into two component factors which we just kind of roughly call uh, central stress and peripheral stress. Central stress tends to map more closely to intensity. So you can think of it kind of like how much high intensity training have you done? You know, uh, whereas the peripheral stress is how much low intensity training have you done? It's not exactly, you know, without kind of getting into the yeah. mathematical differences, you can think of it that way. And one thing we notice is we all the coaches on my team could recall incidents of injury where 
either one of those had been spiked. You know, like if there was a sudden increase in central stress, then we could recall specific injuries that kind of were lined up with that. And then other times when there's a sudden increase in peripheral stress, you know, like we, one thing that we've noticed is some, a story to maybe add some color to it. One of our coaches talked about an athlete who went into a pivot block, right? So the overall training load is reduced, but also the intensity gets turned way down, right? So the intensity is down and there's just not as much overall training, but all the training that there is very, very peripheral. So you're not getting yeah. much total training, but all of it that you are getting is peripheral. So your central stress is way down, but the per peripheral stress could actually be above the baseline level, you know, even though the total is yeah. not that high. Because there's also a component of a spike in new exercises in your training program, right? That's possible. Yes. And so. I think one of the things that I don't think there's anything special about the new exercise itself, but I do think that when you change exercises uh, to a significant degree, there is a possibility that you're now overloading tissues that were underloaded in the prior block. So now you've selected some exercises yeah. Yeah. that put a lot more strain on, say, adductors, uh, and you're in a, you're in a pivot. So you're getting, you know, the peripheral stress that's landing on adductors is way, way higher than they're used to, you know? Now this specific example is, you know, I don't want to paint the picture like it's a guarantee or anything like that, because what happens to a lot of people is they're like, wow, I'm really sore. My adductors are super sore now. So they cool it, <laughs> you know? They pull the throttle back on a few things and they're fine. Um, occasionally it doesn't happen quite that way. It, it does present a risk. Yeah, especially at later training ages because powerlifting is really specialization. Whereas in strength and conditioning for fighting, for hockey, for football, for soccer, baseball, whatnot. It's so much more general, like the byproduct of the training process is a lot more robust uh, in their ability to do different physical tasks from training for, you know, other professional sports. Whereas the byproduct of the powerlifting process is someone who is ungodly strong at three movements. But like, as we know, like the finest adjustment rib position where, where the angle of the bar in your hand on bench press can like completely throw someone off too. Uh, the longer they've been training or usually the higher level they are. And so, yeah, when you're going through such a big specialization process and training, adding the stress to a muscle that's not commonly loaded, it can cause some interesting things to happen for sure. And I would say that's a risk of injury in itself, specializing so heavily in squat, bench, press, deadlift. Yeah. So. I mean, yeah, I would totally agree with that. You know, people that I've had issues with, like that's a very specific scenario. And I think maybe the lesser problem of the two, you know, if you consider the problem of like spikes in peripheral versus spikes in central stress as separate. I think spikes in central stress are probably the bigger problem uh, in terms of injury risk for a power lifter while we're on the topic. That is kind of how I see it playing out is uh, you get people who are especially specialized in a narrow set of things. Uh, then when we go into a pivot and I'm asking them to do things that are, you know, quite different from the things that are normally done, it does kind of present a risk, at least in those early stages until they kind of develop some training history around it. But I think generally you're better off if you can develop that, you know, you mentioned kind of spending more effort on GP programs and things like that. 
in recent times. Is that part of why you've decided to expand that emphasis? Yeah. When you have a more robust athlete, uh, you can apply more training concepts with them if you need to, right? So that's a, an obvious benefit of being robust. I think also there's two things. So can, before let me interrupt um, you just for a second, cause I think that's a really, really important point. I think I'm a good example of both possibilities in one, <laughs> one athlete that for me, my lower body training is not very robust. I have to be very careful about what movements I can do, how much of it I can do. So it's fairly limited. And if the usual things stop working, then where do you go from here? Well, there's not too many options on the table. Whereas you take something like my bench press that has a significant work capacity and it's been pretty injury resistant. If you have an idea on things that you want to try, things that can possibly move the needle forward, chances are I'm capable of doing it, capable of giving it a good shot, yeah. which is just not the case uh, for my personal lower body training. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I, that encapsulates exactly what I guess my hypothesis on one of the benefits of GP is. I, I think the other thing is powerlifters like to focus a lot on their weaknesses, uh, physically and mentally, but I think you also have to keep your strengths strong, you know, uh, and sometimes using your strengths to help you with your weaknesses is, can be a good approach physically and mentally. Uh, and this is actually the philosophy of our, uh, mental skills coach. Well, a very brief overview of the philosophy of our mental skills coach at TSU as a sports psychology background. And so like in the squat, for example, let's say that someone is, you know, they used to adductor Magnus a lot as the first hip extensor out of the bottom position. The adductor Magnus is a, an odd muscle in anatomy because depending on the position of the knee relative to the hip, it can be an adductor, which brings the leg towards the midline. It could be an extensor, which brings the leg back into uh, extension, or it could even be a flexor, which brings the leg forward back towards underneath your stance. Right. And that's just because of it really originates in the body center <laughs> and it's a long muscle, like it inserts down by the knee. So, uh, if your knee is in a different position, it's going to contract to help you. So it's very active. And if you have someone who goes into knee valgus in the squat, it's likely that they're using their adductor magnus quite a bit out of the bottom position to help overcome the cumulative torque demands of that position. And then through working with Megan Jones, who is actually my biomechanics professor in university. So I, I was in her classroom, in her lab, uh, and I, I also work with her just, you know, in general, she tell you that the weakness here is actually the reason why you are using your adductors more with heavy loads, but not with light loads is probably because your, uh, your quadriceps are not strong enough to maintain that position under maximal load. So your body compensates and starts using your adductors. So the two conclusions that you could draw from that are, I need to improve my quads, but you also got to keep your adductors resilient to the stress that you're putting on them with heavy weights, right? So uh, it's both the strength of improving your quads. That's something that you need to work on long-term, but you also need to make sure that your adductors are conditioned starting from that dead stop in, in deep hip and knee flexion with a tremendous amount of force, you know, out of that bottom range, that's where you need the conditioner in your adductor magnus muscle. So it's strong enough to tolerate that. I think that's where you get into the strength and conditioning for powerlifting side of things, which basically GP training. So this is more how I'm trying to attack and mitigate, uh, which is a 
difficult concept, as you said earlier on. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. It's a hard thing to wrap your head around. So on the topic of GP, what might a GP workout look like? Just a typical one that you might write. Yeah. So from, for four years, well, for five years, I did a tremendous amount of interning. Uh, when I was uh, still building TSG and going through university, uh, I was fortunate to uh, intern under Brett Bartholomew when he was working at Unbreakable Performance Center in Los Angeles. And then I was fortunate to uh, intern under Natalie Collars there as well. I was a top strength and conditioning coach based out of Arizona. Uh, Daniel Noble, I was primarily training lacrosse and hockey players out of, out of the Hill Academy at the time in Toronto. And then Ryan Van Aston and Alan Selby with the Calgary Flames NHL team for three years. Well, just under three years. And, um, I, I got exposed to training for a lot of different sports and was fortunate to be a part of the training processes of numerous top coaches and the characteristics of a GP session for her are, are similar to the characteristics of strength and conditioning style workouts for team sports. So there's generally more concepts that we want to attack and out of respect for the person's time, but maybe also just to get their heart rate up a little bit more you know, and, and add more of an energy system conditioning component to the workout. It's pairing exercises. So, uh, quite often we're not like pairing a bicep curl with a hammer curl, you know, something stupid like that, but, uh, it's like an agonist peripheral superset. So maybe you do a set of shoulders and then you do a set of hamstrings, like two things that are not going to conflict with one another because really, I think you want to perform well and do what you're doing properly. Right. So you don't want to shoulder and then do another sloppy shoulder exercise to get a pump. Like that's not why we're doing this. We're doing this to improve the strength or load tolerance in different muscles of the body, or maybe develop that muscle, right? To potentially. You're applying a training load to it, but it doesn't have to be, it's, it's not a training load that you're trying to maximize. You're not. Yeah. A bodybuilder who's really pushing the limits on the development of a particular muscle. These are muscles that are, you know, by definition underdeveloped for powerlifters. Otherwise they wouldn't need this type of intervention. And it's intended to give you a more yep. well-rounded uh, training program. Is that right? Summary? Yeah. So the way I'm attacking these GP plans, uh, when it comes to analysis of the lift. So I guess you could almost say this is thinking of accessories that might help yeah. you. I'm, I'm looking for the most uh, intense phase of that movement. Uh, and then I'm watching the compensations that might occur and I'm trying to figure out what the agonist and the synergist and the antagonist muscles are in that position, how they're acting. Uh, and also I'm looking at the velocity of the movement. And then I'm trying to pick an exercise that's going to fortify your strength in that position. If it's the adductor, going back to our analogy, or if it's the quadricep, then, you know, if you need more strength than deep knee flexion, then you better pick exercises that are increasing strength and deep knee flexion, right? Like it's just kind of obvious connection. And then beyond that, I, I think there's concept of core training, which I waver back and forth on, but now I'm back on it in the programs I'm writing, because I've had numerous long-term clients express to me kind of feeling disconnected to the bar through their midsection. And for our audience, uh, my understanding, the way bracing works is you have two mechanisms at play. Uh, one is that your lungs are like a balloon or an airbag that's inside of your abdomen. And when you inflate that airbag, your spine can't go anywhere. The second is that when you co-contract the abdominal and spinal erector muscles, it's kind of like 
you, you also can't go anywhere in that position. So theoretically increasing the strength of the abdominals and spinal erectors, I, you know, does, does that improve the stiffness of the torso under a heavy load? And is that what these lifters are saying when they say that they want to be more connected through their legs into the bar? Because if you're squatting and your back is a wet noodle, you know, you could have the strongest legs in the world, but you're not going to lift much weight because you're going to be losing a lot of force translating up from the ground through the legs. And then your back's a wet noodle and the bar's going to be all over the place as a result. So it's important to be stiff in the torso. And yeah, I'm back on experimenting with GP core work to see if it will help to fortify that more. Well, and, and also like shoulder thing. stability and stuff like that. Sorry, jumped in there. But that's another thing that I think it's a good example of a muscle group that I think is important and we can all make a good case for its importance in a maximal attempt, but it's also not sufficiently trained in our normal training environment. You know, I think with each of the competitive powerless, there are examples like this, you know, from in the, in the bench press, we're probably more talking about triceps. It's just in a normal training environment where training tends to be submaximal, it's just not going to adequately stimulate that muscle group. So you're going to have to do something else. Uh, to get the rounded development that you're going to need to perform well in a maximal attempt, you know? Yeah. So I, I think these are all the concepts that you're looking when, yeah. when writing GP programming and it's a lot of critical thought that you have to put into those things because you don't want to waste someone's time either. Right? Like right. it better benefit them somehow. And also after competition, especially during like the long buildups, when we're just easing back into harder training again, maybe get your conditioning up to par while we're still doing easy training by prescribing some conditioning to kind of kickstart that process. So this is another idea that I've been experimenting with. Well, Theoretically, it should work. I'm curious to see how it does. I mean, this is no surprise really matches up has a lot of congruency with your uh, initial hypothesis that you laid out like in the point about making sure that you're uh, doing a little bit of aerobic conditioning you know and you want to do that at an appropriate time and so on but you know you were talking about like when wellness and readiness are sufficient uh, then you can prescribe training to get people stronger that also implies the counter to that, which is if wellness is not sufficient. If you're, you know, barely hanging on here, then yeah. you're going to have some problems. And, you know, as somebody like I'm not yet 40, but I've been doing this a long time and I would like to continue to do it a long time. As you go, it needs to, powerlifting is a sport, you know, we can make all the arguments we want about sports being inherently unhealthy it's not you know an optimization of health necessarily but you do have to care for it enough that uh, you know you're not getting in your own way well it's not only health i'll give you this analogy and i'm paraphrasing it from the conditioning for hockey uh, which was written by ryan van Aston, and it's just a in general a great strength and conditioning book for someone to read. And if you think about a power lifter, they all have big engines and that's their horsepower. But from there, the size of the gas tank, which supplies that engine with the fuel to operate can vary. You know, you can have someone who can smash four hour workouts, you know, back to back. And then on the flip side, you've got someone who can do, you know, six to 10 reps before they're cooked, you know, and this is a very wide spectrum and they could both be competing at a world championship against one another. So, uh, you talk about like the need for individualization there. It's very strong. And then 
regardless of whether you have a big or small gas tank, you also have to put fuel back into it to fuel your next performance. And so if you're doing a set of five, it might take you 30 seconds, 40 seconds. And the first two reps might be your fastest performing reps of that set. So there you're using creatine phosphate and intramuscular ATP to, to power that effort. And then speed starts going down, starts getting harder. Your force output is starting to decrease. Now you're starting to use your anaerobic glycolytic system. A byproduct of that is what we know is fatigue, the burn in your muscles. And if you carry that process on, you eventually hit the point of muscular failure and then you can't do any more and you've got to recover. If, once you've done that set and you're reviewing your video, hydrating, I'm listing all the exemplary training habits that I wish people used, you know, right. you're watching your video, you're hydrating, you're checking the weights to make sure that they're tight on the bar. And then you're chalking your hands for the next set. And before you do that, you fill out your training journal too. I think that's an ideal use of rest time. You're using your aerobic system to replenish the energy stores that you just depleted in time for the next set. So in that set of five reps and your rest time after that, you used your creatine phosphate system, anaerobic glycolytic system, and your aerobic system to recover, right? So. If you have someone who has a really big engine, but they have a really small gas tank and their recovery time is pretty slow as well, they, they can't put fuel back in that gas tank quickly and they need to increase their training dose to progress. This is when I think you're really screwed. You know, it's going to take a really long time to get out of that position. And I think this is a problem with trying only to train at the minimum dose is yeah, you can get stronger by doing super high intensity training with low volume. But if that's all you do, if you do not have those higher volume periods of training that improve your volume tolerance, you will become a very specialized and one-sided athlete. And it's going to be hard to get yourself out of that position when you do need to increase your dose to get stronger. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So when it comes to the GP prescriptions, are you typically programming these as separate sessions or is it part of you know, training session that's going to, I guess, tackle more specific goals? Is it only maybe in certain times of year? Yeah. So after a competition. Uh, we'll definitely, you know, there's some people want to break, some people want to get back at it. So I tackle that question first to make sure that your head is going to be in the game long-term. And uh, if you want to get back at it, I'll throw the kitchen sink of what I think you need after that competition to, you know, condition yourself better for the training to come. Some of that can be accessories to fortify your strengths. Some of it can be accessories to tackle your weaknesses. Others can be general core or shoulder stability exercises, physique development, bodybuilding, uh, and aerobic based conditioning. Maybe if I think you need to build the size of your gas tank, we'll start doing some anaerobic conditioning as well to try to expand your abilities in that area. And that's usually like a three week phase before we transition into not hard training again, but we're increasing the specificity of training. And if you don't have a competition in the near future, we're increasing the intensity of training, but we're still doing a lot of general exercises, continuing with that theme that we've started. The way I have been conceptualizing this is that in hockey, it's also, you know, you. I had a, a professor in university, he's from the UK, and he said, it's so crazy to me 
the tactics of hockey are very similar to soccer in some regards, except for these guys are doing it at like 40 kilometers an hour on, on a knife's edge, you know, and they're taking a hundred mile an hour slap shots at each other. Like it's a pretty wild, fast game. And it's very specialized at the most of being an elite skater. Doesn't, you know, if you're comparing <laughs> on ice to on land, it's very different things. And after the two off seasons that I was a part of with the Calgary Flames, they would take two to three weeks off completely from training at the end of the season. And then you would do a three week GP phase, get your mobility right just getting back in shape to train and you're not skating at this time. So now you're already at like five weeks of not skating. And then it's like, it was only halfway through the strength phase that would follow where they would just start easing back into skating to start getting ready for the next season. And why can't this concept apply to powerlifting? You know, if you have a power lifter, just done 500 straight weeks of training the same three movements. You're damn right. There's going to be some injuries in that process, right? right? right. Like, so just more ideas I've been tinkering around with. Let me, I guess, throw out there some ways that I've been dealing with a lot of these same types of thoughts. I've been categorizing training effect in three broad categories like any training that you do is going to affect systems of the body in three big categories one would be skill acquisition skill development the other would be structural adaptations and the third would be metabolic energy system adaptations and i think yeah. a lot of the training effects pro there's probably not probably not all of them and some definitely kind of fall somewhere in between but any training intervention that you do is going to have it in those three ways, at least those three ways. So being, I've been more attentive to the way I expect a certain training event, intervention to affect those systems as well. You know, so being more intentional about taking periods uh, where I'm intentionally not developing the skill of the power lifts, you know, I'm trying to let that resensitize a bit to speak to your uh, the example you just gave. Uh, but also, you know, there are different energy systems. I want to make sure that I'm not just hammering the same one for block after block year after year, right? Uh, same with structural adaptations or skill development as well. Like it's not just performance of powerlifting in a sport context is not just, you know, executing a squat. It's executing a squat at maximal intensity. And there's a number of things that kind of go yep. along with that, you know, and you can specialize and develop those things you know, as you go through a training process. You know, you, there's the basic coordination. You could develop that if that's where you need to focus your attention. There's a uh, rate of force development if that's where you need to focus your attention. There's maximal force out and, and so on. So I want to think about those things and try to... Uh, try to make sure that I'm intentional about, you know, not leaving gaps in how I'm developing an athlete. You know, so I think about that when we do pivot block, for example, like there, we have our goals for a pivot. There's five goals that we set are part of any pivot. You know, one of those being uh, durability. Uh, and I think that kind of speaks to what we're talking about with uh, GP making sure that we're not neglecting muscle groups. Lots of stuff gets backburnered. You know, when you're time constrained, you're pushing a lot of training load and you really need a block to move the needle in on your sport performance. You know, but the other stuff that got backburnered is still important and it still has to find its way into the program, right? So having a spot in the program where you say this is where it goes <laughs> is helpful you know so it doesn't just continue to get pushed off forever yeah yeah you want to be specialized but not too specialized yeah basically there's a line to walk there for sure yeah i 
yeah, I agree with all those things. And I think there's this idea of mastery, but <laughs> I don't think you're ever done in, in, in lifting, like your, your technique is always evolving, you know, your energetic characteristics will change based on the type of training that you're doing. You can always um, increase the demand, right? Like you increase the weight on the bar and something changes about the timing or something changes about like a good example of this, an extreme example, but a good one. Uh, if you watch Blaine squat 500 kilos uh, from the Arnold, the first time that he did it, the bar whip is absolutely insane, you know? So the limiting factor for him in completing that lift is his ability to manage the bar whip, you know? Now that's a very specific yeah. skill that he has to develop, but it just highlights, you know, the challenge that you face squatting 400 kilos is not the same challenge that you face squatting 500 kilos. And the same is true all the way down. Like even for some, it's not always bar whip, right? Like there's, but you're managing a body and bar system in space and the demands of that change. And if you can meet these demands, well, we'll just put more weight on the bar <laughs> and it's going to change again. Yeah. The way I view it is quite similar to the way that you view it. I'm trying to evaluate the athlete's biomechanics or physiology. Also, like, especially at higher levels, I guess at any level, it's just more pronounced at higher levels. There's a certain, you know, you, you could tell in the communications with an athlete how that meet's going to go. Like, I think just like that man or, or woman on a mission sort of thing, you know, you're like, yeah, this meet's going to go well, right? And, and, you just have that sense by the look in their eyes when they're training, the motivation, the doing the right steps. So this, the psychology of the athlete, I'm trying to pay attention to that. Also, trying to keep an eye on what we might need to do if it's a placing-based goal. So also tactics, not in the sense of like, we're going to make attempts that we're not capable of, but like, this is where the standard is for that class. And you got to be aware of that, you know, keep yeah. being at the front of the pack with that. And then within a periodization plan, I think there's a few main goals. And the first one would fall into what I call a transition phase. That's after the competition or a peak or when you're just doing a step taper to, it's basically like your pivot to chill and build back up again. Physical and mental regeneration from specific training is important and yeah. improving strength and conditioning and overall fitness for future training is are the main objectives of that phase. And then in a preparatory phase, which could either be more general or more specific, depending on proximity to the competition, I think the goal is to build and to assess where that person's volume tolerance is. That's for us, right? So how much training do we need to do to improve at these intensities that we are training at and how much training how are they tolerating the training? Could they do more? Do we need to do less, right? Just trying to adjust that dose. And then there's a development phase, and this is not consistent with periodization terminology. Might be called a transmutation or a intensification or something like that. The reason why I called it a development phase is because I think strength is an adaptation to increase in load fundamentally and whether it's the chicken or the egg that comes first there you know we don't know but in the development phase instead of building and assessing the volume tolerance which requires increasing volume now we are increasing intensity right it's, it's focusing on a different area and i think right there 
the transition phase and the preparatory phase are focused on recovery, which is something that it's not very like popular in the, in talking about in training. And then also focusing on your volume tolerance. So it's a weird concept to train when the goal isn't to improve your maximum strength for some people. And I think those people will struggle to last or they will have to figure this out at a later time. And then when you're peaking or when you're just trying to get stronger in a long non-competitive period, increasing intensity in the 80 to 90% range can probably get you there, you know, doing heavy fives, threes, stuff like this. And then finally there's peaking, right? 85, 95% practicing for second attempts, trying to reduce as much variability from the performance of those skills as possible so that we have a reliable athlete on meet day where we know what their first attempt is going to look like. We know what their second attempt is going to look like. And based on our plan, we have very good confidence that the third attempt range we have on our meet strategy is where their strength and execution is going to fall within on meet day. And then it's kind of restarting that process. And so this is how I'm viewing periodization now. Yeah. Yeah. I see a lot of parallels with, with how I've been viewing this lately as well. So I've been looking at it through the lens that, so I was talking just a minute ago about the skill structure, uh, metabolism sort of lens. And, um, I've kind of used that as a, as an outline for how I'm structuring training blocks. I mean, of course, all this is subject to athlete response, you know, and you always have to defer to that. I think I've grown in my appreciation for needing a starting point. You know, you can't just fling stuff at an athlete hoping to, you know, just observe what works and only rely on that. There's just too many bad ideas <laughs> and i yeah, came yeah. to realize that like i myself was bringing a lot of prior knowledge of periodization systems and things like that to the way i was writing training even without being fully aware that i was doing that and that was really helpful so i've tried to systematize that a little bit more as well um, but it does lend itself nicely to having a block that's focused on structural adaptation having a block that's focused on metabolic adaptation, how to block this focus on skill adaptation, but then also acknowledging that those other categories aren't just doing nothing while you're doing that, you know, and you've got to come up with training that is sensible, you know, training that, that pairs together. For instance, it would be really difficult uh, to do training that is both going to make a strong impact, a strong stimulus for structural adaptation and also for systemic energy systems at the same time. It's just, yeah, there's just too much going on there. So any training that you do, like it, say it's a classic hypertrophy training intervention, uh, it's going to be primarily to get you a structural adaptation, which is what hypertrophy is. There will be a, a, an energy system adaptation to go along with it. You just kind of need to be aware of that and, you know, Take note of it. It's like, okay, we've done, you know, five blocks in a row and they've all been focused on, you know, building capacity, uh, energy system capacity or something like that. Maybe we should change that, you know. I think it, yeah. it helped a, a staleness uh, viewpoint. But what I see, you know, it, and this kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier too about like taking a more prolonged period away from the comp lifts and that be a helpful thing as well. You know, you can, you can look at that from the perspective of skill development, you know, and kind of intentionally take some time away from it. Uh, if you've you just competed, you do your kind of week or two weeks of, you need a mental and uh, some time to just kind of play around and get the rest of life priorities in order. Okay. 
well now it's time to start stepping back into the gym but you just did this huge peak like do we need to really zero in on more skill development well i mean it's an open question right and it's going to depend on the, the level of the athlete some athletes will need that and that'll be where they're going to make the best progress but if you've been doing this for a minute you know and there's probably something to be gained by letting those adaptations cool off a little bit. You know, I think from yeah. a skill acquisition standpoint, there's probably more to be gained from having some periods of like letting the skill deteriorate a little bit and then train it up again versus just hammer away at it all the time. Yeah, it's not going to take long. Like I, I think we had our biggest case study that you're going to be okay, even if you detrain during COVID when a lot of lifters couldn't train. And now everyone's back to yeah. hit PRs again. Like everyone's survived that experience from a training standpoint. You know what I mean? And so it's, it's going to be okay if like you don't lift heavy for a few weeks it's going to be okay if you just improve your fitness without addressing the specific technical skills which are more important but need to happen later on in our process yeah i, I agree with you man I mean, I, we're kind of bumping up against our time limit here i feel like we could keep going i know we could keep going uh, but before we conclude i wanted to ask you is there anything that you wanted to mention or talk about uh, that we didn't get a chance to touch on no i think just to summarize on the topic of reducing injury risk it's it's one of those areas where it's hard to define what success is because success is nothing happening right and so you can't quantify when nothing happens but if a lifter is experiencing pain, they should stop feeding what's causing them pain. Being specific all of the time, I won't say is bad, uh, it'll conclude with this, but it increases the risk of injury. I think effort needs to be paid towards monitoring readiness and wellness as well, because when those are off, this increases the risk of injury. And I think spikes in anything, when you've done a prolonged period of time where you are not prepared for that, is also an increase in risk for not only injury, but also just performance impairment, because you can get squashed by the training demand, you know? So those would be my four or five things i don't know how many listed there yeah but the final thing is that i think injury also needs to be accepted as part of competitive sport powerlifting is fortunate to have low injury rates compared to other sports and i would take a strained hamstring any day over a concussion you know like uh, generally the problems that plague the powerlifter I'd say are less serious compared to other sports, still serious, less, you know, you're not looking at CT from powerlifting. And so I think every powerlifter needs to accept that there is injury risk in training. And if you train always to protect from injury risk, the same things that protect from injury risk are also some of the things that can make you stronger. So. Uh, are you here to get stronger or are you here to stay safe? Uh, because I think the safe place you can't even argue is on the couch because then you're going to die to being sedentary, you know? Right. So really you've got, if you boil all this down, you have to stress the body as reasonably and as logically as you can. Uh, you have to use a reactive approach to adjust the plan when something's not going to plan. Uh, you have to have a strong relationship with your coach or with your athlete um, so that the communication is open and the adherence is strong. All things that like, we all know, man, you know, like, well, and that was, we do, but I find that one of the things that made a difference to me was I said, okay, yeah, these are things I know, 
but what happens if I take it as seriously as I can? You know, like if it's, if this is something I know yeah. and it's really is important and it is, then what should I do about that? And for me, it looked like diving into the numbers like I hadn't done previously. And that's partly just that that's where my orientation is at. I know it's where your orientation is too. It's definitely led to better outcomes. I've had fewer injuries yeah. in our program uh, since we're speaking of injuries specifically. It's been better since doing that. You know, it's, you know, it's part of the learning process. And, you know, it's something like investing in the stock market or something like that. Like you, you need to, people talk about diversifying and that reduces your risk for any one thing to go wildly, wildly off the rails, but you can't diversify away all risk. You know, there's some risk that's part of the system inherently. And yeah, definitely. It, that's still the case in good sport training. And I think you make a really good point that you may not even want to get, you remove all risk because that starts to not look like a very effective powerlifting program anymore. The key would be just to reduce unnecessary risk. I definitely found places where I could do that. I don't feel like I've compromised, uh, you know, the effectiveness of the program that, that I'm running. I'm sure you feel the same way. Uh, so it's definitely worth looking. Yeah. Maybe whereas you dove into the numbers, we started working with an injury management team and gosh, like him strength and conditioning coaches or like for most of my career, if an athlete had an injury, I felt so on an island, you know, like you get this gut wrenching email of like, I went to my PT and they did acupuncture and they said I should be good to go. And you're like, oh my God, like I, I need a little bit more guidance here. Like what's this return to sport look like? Like, what do you think the injury is? Uh, what exercises need to be done, if any, to help heal from this? What's our timeline like to get back to sport from this? Like, these are really important questions. And our injury management team answers all these, explains what the, the, the mechanism of the injury is. Man, I've learned so much from them. And yeah, it's... I'd say increasing the size of our, of the team around me has been like the best thing I've ever done and for, uh, developing as a coach. And I, at the second best thing is to stop being so damn prideful about like the training and writing and just like try to be more open-minded with what other people are doing. And this is something that I hope will happen, uh, more in the coaching profession as powerlifting continues to grow because there's no sign really to me that this is stopping anytime soon, the growth of the sport, like it's just positive momentum and the difference from one world championship to the next and professionalism is like really impressive. And obviously what SVD is doing with Sheffield, the, I think these are all things that happen, just human things, but on the topic of injury. Two things that really grind my gears are coaches who act like they don't have them or that they have all the solutions to prevent them is, is really one. Uh, and an extension of that is suggesting that our training is somehow more injurious or dangerous than other forms of training. Like there's no data to support this. You, there's no data to support the amount of injuries that we prevented either because you can't, you can't trap that. Right. So the second thing is, and this is just like kind of shitty, but like when Leah hit her back and hurt her back, and this is one of those things where people are dicks, you know? people like kicking her when she's down, like, you're never going to come back from this. Like, man, like, why is it that when you get hurt, now you're going to get kicked while you're down? Like, 
powerlifting at its core is an awesome community. And with the coaches I talk to in person at meets or podcasts or whatnot, it's like, damn, like we have so much in common. Like our problems are the same. Our interests are the same. Like, you know, there's a lot of common ground to, to build strong relationships on and, and improve coaching as a result of that. And I would like to see more of that on the topic of uh, injury risk reduction yeah. and less of saying this training system causes more injuries than this one, because it's all bullshit. And also less of kicking people while they're down, you know, and more of wishing them well and being good sportsmen on the platform. I think this is just a thing of decency to other humans. Yeah. So, I mean, to think so, I know. It is, it is one of those things that's been part of powerlifting culture since forever. The, the supportive and a good <laughs> part of that experience. But, you know, I guess part of me would like to blame it on the internet. Like that's people are jerks on the internet. And generally, I feel like there's more well, asshole -ish behavior on the internet than there is in real life. Somebody run the numbers on that one. Matt put this in his book. It's, he quoted me, and I was like, I said that? Like, apparently I did. And I, what I said is that social media is at the virtue that's growing the sport, and it's the vice that's tearing the people within it apart. And I think that's pretty true. I think so, yeah. I, it is one of the things I worry about. We could have a king of the lifts conversation about this, I think. But it's one of the things I worry about with the growth of the sport is that we're losing a bit of what makes powerlifting awesome, you know? And yeah, to me, I'm not like all about it either. You know, like I definitely want powerlifting to grow. If you were like, Hey, powerlifting is going to grow. It's going to be awesome. You're going to be able to make a career out of this as an athlete, but culturally it's going to be the same as the UFC. I think I'm out at that point. Like I just am not interested in that yeah. style of living. <laughs> I mean, Mike, I'm sure you can beat someone's clock pretty good if you got in the fight instead of powerlifting. But I'm maybe past that time of my life. It's probably a reason you chose powerlifting. <laughs> it's probably a reason you chose powerlifting instead of fighting. And yeah, like powerlifting to me is, it's changed quite a bit from and it's not like I'm some long timer, you know, I've been doing it for 12 years now, but that's dropping the pen compared to others changed quite a bit. Like, I feel like now when I'm going into a meet, it's so much more of a socially charged event than it used to be, you know, where it felt like it used to be more of a gathering of friends and like, there is still that, but it's just socially charged now in a different way. And I think powerlifting is being built as if it's UFC or WE by certain personalities who are influential. And. I don't agree with building it that way. You know, I think we both built our businesses on professionalism and respect of others. And I guess that's not, that's never going to be trendy. I, I think it's an approach that lasts. So, yeah, well, I think the good news is that powerlifting at its core is still that. And I mean, I think that's a good reason to talk about it is because I don't want that part to change i mean look not everybody's got to be friends and if we're you know there's like legitimate conflict then fine but i don't know that's that doesn't seem like it's worth focusing on to me but yeah see we should talk to somebody who does think that it's worth focusing on that might be a conversation that's worth having but maybe after the final deadlift we'll have a fight on the platform <laughs> next year we'll get on espn like that settle our differences that's the highlight of the meet yeah. so yeah man i 
can't thank you enough for joining me today. I always appreciate your thoughts and it's always a pleasure to compare notes with you. Yeah, it's always a blast. So uh, thank you for your time and thank you for the uh, invitation as well.